are these people? This came up in my feed, Colin. I, Eva Bartlett wrote this a while ago. Um, but it came up in my feed, and I felt like since, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I did since 1948, talking about that it's been a minute that we've been seeing these kinds of things. I, I, I felt like it was kind of a continuation of that, you know? Mm -hmm. So first published at Crescent International, Eva Bartlett, one of those indie media award winners. Um, you know, she writes observations from occupied Palestine, i.e. Gaza. So uh, pay attention to dates as I read them. Um, you know, this was, like I said, uh, you know, a while ago. So, you know, you'll, you'll get a feel for, for what time frame we're in. But she writes... Unusually heavy torrential rains last month inundated much of Gaza, which was already reeling from a tight Israel-Egyptian siege since 2006. Hundreds of thousands of people have been affected, with more than 5,000 evacuated from their homes, power outages of 20 to 22 hours daily, or complete days have become the norm, affecting every facet of life in Gaza. You'll notice that not a lot has changed as we read this. Um, the Gaza Strip, a 40 kilometer long, it's probably shorter now, 12 kilometers at its widest point, 365 square kilometers strip of land, is host to 1.7 million Palestinians. Definitely a lot less of them now. Two thirds right. of whom are refugees. So... While Gaza's suffering extends decades back since 2006, much of the world has cut ties with Gaza, and since 2007, Israel, supported by Egyptian and Western powers, has enforced a full blockade on the Strip. It is not merely an economic blockade, but rather a full lockdown on movement, goods, access to healthcare outside, and limiting the import of fuel, cooking gas, and medicines, to name some items, into the enclave impacts on every facet of life imaginable so that's where she's starting so we end up in november 2008 i joined a boat of european parliamentarians sailing from cyprus to the strip attempting to symbolically break the blockade apart from the act of solidarity was also my sole means of entering gaza with all but one border crossing controlled by israel and the remaining crossing by the complicit mubarak rule in egypt Entry by sea was the only option. However, the outcome was not certain. Israel also controls Palestinian waters. It is not merely an economic blockade, but rather a full lockdown on movement, goods, access to healthcare outside. I just read that. Um, I thought I clicked the next button. So, organized by the Free Gaza Movement, the November sailing was the third of its kind. Two more boats reached Palestinian shores before Israeli warships began violently obstructing passage, including ramming one boat. I joined the handful of other human rights activists from ISM to begin what would be three years of the most surreal and horrific experiences as an activist I have ever had, Eva writes. So, she says our work comprised accompanying farmers and fishers as they attempted to work their trades, routinely coming under machine gun fire from Zionist soldiers. In the case of the fishers, they are also subject to shelling and heavy-powered water cannon attacks, the force of which shatters windows, splits wooden structural components of the boats, and destroys electronic navigation equipment. The Israeli Navy often adds a chemical to the spray, which leave the soaked victims steaking of excrement for days. In one assault on fishers, the Navy first sprayed machine gun fire at a fishing trawler one kilometer off Gaza's northern coast for about 15 minutes, then firing a missile which set the boat aflame. The fishers jumped overboard and were saved, but the boat was not. Gutted by flames, the vessel was destroyed, and along with it, the livelihoods of the eight or so fishers who regularly worked on that boat. When when are we, Colin? 2008? Yep. Well before October 7th, correct? Um, mm -hmm. So, um, half an hour into my first venture out with the fishers in November, an Israeli gunboat charged us, swerving at the last minute. 
intimidation. The fishers scrambled to reel in their nets. Soon after, another gunboat sped towards us, water cannon firing. Our trawler managed to escape before the dousing. This minor harassment pales in comparison to the repeated assaults that usually occur when fishers try to fish even a few miles off the coast. Under the Oslo Accords, Palestinian fishers have the right to fish 20 nautical miles out, but under Israeli rule, six miles is the limit. Often, when the fishers are attacked at sea, it is repeatedly as the Israeli Navy follows them from one location to the next, rendering their fishing efforts largely fruitless. Which, big deal in Palestinian culture, by the way. I don't know if you've seen the designs on the kufia, but nets are part of it. Right? Yeah. Big deal for them. So, fishers are routinely abducted. Their boats stolen by the Navy. If the boats are returned, is inevitably after many months and stripped bare of nets and equipment. The process of abducting fishers usually plays out as such. One or more Israeli gunboats attack the fishing trawler or the small road boats common in Gaza with machine gun fire and or shelling. The Navy orders the fishers to strip down to their underwear, dive into the water, and often makes the fishers swim or tread water for extended periods Regardless of the temperature of the water, fishers are then hauled aboard, abducted to a detention center, and interrogated on anything but fishing. A similar policy of intimidation plays out daily in Gaza's border regions, where farmers and anyone working or living near the border face potential machine gun fire or shelling. This includes some of the Strip's poorest, usually children, who work in border regions collecting stones and rubble from Israeli army-destroyed homes for resale in the construction industry. These laborers face danger twice over, the threat of being targeted by a machine gunning shelling and the threat of unexploded ordinances beneath the rubble exploding when disturbed. He links videos to that. Feel free to check the description in the, in the links below. Um, that's, that's how you say that. Check the links below in the description below. Jesus. Um, if you want to check out the article in full. Um, but during the 2008 to 2009 war on the people of Gaza, in addition to warplane bombings, many homes in the border regions were destroyed by demolition explosives. Does that sound familiar, Care Bear? Um, this was in tandem with the international destruction of wells and cisterns in border regions. Tanks and bulldozers churned up huge swaths of land into unworkable waves of earth. The combination of this all rendered the areas flanking the border unlivable and almost impossible to farm. Farmers who attempted to access their land, be they elderly or children, male and female, are routinely targeted by Israeli soldiers. A 50-meter buffer zone established unilaterally by Israeli authorities on the Gaza side in the mid-90s has over the years been expanded to the current 300-meter buffer zone. In reality, the actual policy is one of attacking Palestinians as far as two kilometers from the border. Again, this is in 2008, 2009, right? Which is not all that long ago. So... This off-limits area steals roughly one-third of Gaza's agricultural land, land which happens to be some of the most fertile soil in the Strip. This is an area formerly known as Gaza's breadbasket for the many olive, fruit, and nut trees, wheat and rye, lentils and chickpeas, and various vegetables and fruits that once grew abundantly on these lands. Now in the name of security, every week or two, armored bulldozers accompanied by tanks flatten swaths of farmland even beyond Israeli-imposed 300-meter limit. We accompany farmers planting wheat or harvesting their crops, often low-growing crops like parsley or lentils. While doing this, they routinely come under fire from Israeli soldiers and jeeps or shooting sniper-style from dirt mounds along the border fence. Some of the farmers are paid laborers, earning the equivalent of $5 a day at best, which they contribute to their families' incomes. Others are grandparents, grandchildren, working land their families have farmed for generations. Military gun towers are spread along the length of the border, including remotely controlled towers with swiveling machine guns, 
fired by soldiers with joysticks in control rooms kilometers away. Our policy was to stand with arms raised and visibly empty of anything that could be constructed as threatening and to stay in place until the farmers wanted to leave. It was about farmers reclaiming land they are being forcefully pushed off of by the Israeli policies and shootings. We only wore a thin fluorescent vest and most of us carried still or video cameras to document the aggression. When the soldiers shoot, it is often after surveilling farmers for extended periods. In one such instance, the army watched us working on land over 500 meters from the border for two hours, choosing the moment when the farm laborers were pushing a stalled pickup truck full of parsley to begin sniping at them. Although we stood in front of the farmers, between them and the soldiers, the latter shot around us, hitting a 17-year-old deaf farm laborer in his calf. In another instance, we came under heavy fire for over 40 minutes from Israeli soldiers roughly 500 meters away. The farmers lay flat on the ground with no cover to protect them. We stood, bullets flying within meters of our hands, heads, and feet. The Canadian embassy called me to say they would do nothing and that humanitarian workers should be aware of the Israeli security policies in Gaza's border region. So... We know what happens to humanitarian aid workers in Israel now, though, don't we? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Even if the injury is not an immediately fatal one, people who are shot in the border areas risk bleeding to death before reaching medical care. Ambulances, also targeted by Israeli shooting and shelling, cannot risk coming too near to the border. So an Ahmed Deeb, a 21-year-old who attended a protest against the border policies, was shot in his femoral artery, by the time a group of young men carried him to an ambulance further away, he had lost too much blood and died upon reaching the hospital. On June 14, 2009, we joined Palestinian vo volunteers in Gaza's northern region of Bet Hanun to search for the corpse of a young man gone missing. Two months prior, a shepherd in the area had reportedly having smelled what seemed to be a dead body in the northeastern region near the border fence. As we walked in a line, combing the ground for the body, Israeli soldiers began firing on us. The dead man's father walked with us, ducking with each shot fired our way. The bullets came closer and more quickly as we located the badly decomposed body, loaded him onto a sheet, and hauled him away, the father wailing. The Israelis deny Palestinians even the dignity of recovering the bodies of their loved ones. Again, June 14th, 2009. Right. Our intent in accompanying the ambulances was to deter the warplanes, tanks, and drones from attacking medics. We were spurned on by the fact that in the first week already, two medical workers have been killed and 15 more injured in the line of duty. By the end of the 23 days of attacks, 23 emergency workers had been killed and 50 injured. Medics and rescue workers under the Geneva Conventions are to be provided safe access to the injured and dead. In Gaza, as with so many things, international law matters not, and medics are prevented from reaching those calling for them, and medics are targeted, as we still know. In the first few minutes of attacks, Israeli warships targeted police stations in densely populated areas throughout the Strip, Shifa Hospital, Gaza's main hospital, was a chaotic mess of people seeking out loved ones and bodies all over the place. The floors were covered with people of varying degrees of severity waiting for treatment, including in the under-equipped ICU. Ambulances and cars screened past in an endless stream, dropping out the injured and the dead. The Red Crescent Station in the east of Jab Jabalia, northern Gaza, was as of our second morning with the medics too dangerous to access. The land invasion had begun during the night, shells flying dangerously close to the building. By morning, it was impossible to access, and by the end of the attacks, we returned to find it studded with machine gun fire and hit by shelling. Also by the second morning, a medic I had worked with throughout the evening was killed from a dart bomb fired at his ambulance. On January 6th, Israeli bombs targeted a UN school Takora, a known sanctuary housing numerous 
internally displaced Palestinians when the fourth bomb struck 43 civilians were killed and 10 injured. During the course of accompanying the medics, I saw people horrifically burned and maimed by white phosphorus used in various locations throughout Gaza, white phosphorus burns until deprived of oxygen. I also saw terrified civilians who had been kept hostage by the army, denied food, water, medicines, and in many cases terrorized people streaming from areas all over northern Gaza, on foot, under the bombs, seeking safety where none is to be had. And victims of drone strikes, the army employs the double tap bombing method, strike an area and strike it again within minutes. Precision bombing those who've come to help victims are the first strike. I will never forget the shrill wailing of a man whose wife was caught in that fatal second tap, shrieking as he picked up the pieces of his beloved and it accompanied her to the morgue. Many atrocities later, at the end of 23 days of incessant bombings, we began to see the immensity of the attacks strip wide. People assassinated point blank, including children, families buried alive in bombings of entire buildings, the survivors of which then denied medical care for days until many died of their injuries. Racist hate graffiti left on the walls of homes occupied by Zionist soldiers. Football field-sized earthen pits used to hold prisoners, stripped naked, held for days, some of whom were then taken to Israeli prisons. Hospitals bombed, including with white phosphorus, including a rehabilitation hospital where most of the patients were invalids, kindergartners, Universities, mosques, markets, schools, and farms bombed and destroyed. The nightmare scenario played itself in November 2012, under eight days of Israeli bombings which killed 171 Palestinians. Not only did the army massacre more Palestinians, it also wrecked havoc on the Strip's infrastructure, again destroying key bridges, water and sewage lines, schools, a soccer stadium, health clinics and hospitals, television stations, leaving Palestinians again to clean up the mess of Israeli war games. At the same time, Israeli authorities have restricted and now banned construction materials into Gaza, rendering the rebuilding of destroyed homes and buildings nearly impossible. Even with the massacres and shootings, even without the massacres and shootings, life is beyond unbearable in Gaza. In 2006, Zionist warplanes bombed Gaza's sole power plant, which they provided roughly half of the Strip's energy needs. Since then, the ban on construction materials and replacement parts has meant that the plant has never fully been rehabilitated. The death of power causing rolling blackouts in good times. Power outages are only six to eight hours long every day. Currently, with a fuel shortage generated both by the complicity of the Ramallah government and the bombing of the lifeline tunnels between Gaza and Egypt, Gaza is so deficient in fuel to run its power plant that the power outages vary from 14 to 18 hours a day on average. This dangerously impacts the health, sanitation, water, education, and industrial sectors. Hospital life support equipment, operation rooms, ICUs, dialysis machines, refrigerators for plasma and medicines, and evil, simple, hygienic laundering services are all, effect, are all affected. Sanitation plants already overworked for want of repair and expanded sewage holding pools end up dumping 90 million liters of more sewage into the sea. Under power outages, dumping is compounded, and sewage pools sometimes overflow into residential areas and has recently happened in a district of Gaza. I visited a few tunnels during my time in Gaza through some of the hundreds of tunnels running from Gaza to Egypt have been fortified and are large enough to bring in banned items like vehicles or even camels. The tunnels I saw were small, weakly fortified in patches with wood planks, and overlapping neighboring tunnels side by side, one over another. Those working in the tunnels are amongst Gaza's desperately poor, working long, unbearably hot hours for a pittance and always subject to the dangers of tunnel collapse, electrocution for poor wiring on inside, or Zionist bombings. But the tunnels at least 
allowed into Gaza things banned or limited by the Zionist regime. In the years between 2008 and 2010, these banned items included random things like diapers, A4 paper, livestock, seeds, fertilizers, shoes, and pasta. The Israeli regime went as far to calculate the minimum amount of calories needed to keep Palestinians not quite fully starving. Even after lightening of some of these ridiculous restrictions, the tunnels were still critical to the import of adequate amounts of fuel and cooking gas. Damage to the coastal aquifer from overextraction will be reversible in 2020 if no action is taken now. A 2012 UN report notes, at the moment, 95% of water in Gaza is undrinkable, according to WHO standards. The manufactured layers of crisis rendering life in Gaza utterly unbearable and dangerous have continued to escalate, while at the same time, the media blackout on Gaza continues. From my experiences in the Strip, including meetings with the different water, sanitation, health, and agriculture officials, I learned from the current 80% dependence on food aid could be reversed, unemployment rates lowered, and a decent quality of light possible if, and only if, the blockade is lifted. Exports and freedom of movement allowed, and Israeli attacks on farmers and fishers halted. Until then, and until world leaders, including Canada's own, stop their blind support of the Zionist state, and act to enforce the numerous UN resolutions affording justice to Palestinians, the suffering will only worsen. So, again, all of this well before October 6th. Tell me it doesn't sound like it was written yesterday. You know? So, right. uh, you know, uh, thoughts, anything, hit me. Uh, what more needs to be said about what yeah. we have now? Uh, pretty much every week at this point since other than October. screaming right. in righteous anger again and again you know so but yeah I think I, you know I think it was good that she talked about what the tunnels actually used for you know mm-hmm. like I haven't heard much of that but this is why Eva's you know indie media honoree so she does good work please go check out her stuff links are in the description below Anything else you want to add? So, no. Well, I mean, as we say, uh, accusation is confession. So, yep. the things that they've claimed, and I think, honestly, this is kind of why they say a lot of these things, because people are not necessarily going to do their research or have very short to know what they did. In pa- Israelis did in Palestine prior to October seventh. Yeah. So it's just the idea of like, oh, that we, you know, like I'm not going to go into it now because I'm kind of afraid of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. YouTube <laughs> being asked, but, um, but you're right. It's just like, how is this any? This has been. It's not. We kind of look at these things. I think, oh, this is something that we knew that they were doing. No, this is, they've been doing it. It just hasn't really been, I would argue now, underreported. But, like, people wasn't necessarily talking about this in the same way prior to October 7th. It was just kind of that, I guess now with, given the intensity of the assault now, that more people are kind of, the connection and are now talking about it a little bit more. But this has been happening and people weren't talking about this this way back then. I guess because now but I think just generally in terms of living here it's like, oh, is that thing over there yeah. that we don't need to think or worry about? Um, only when, when it applies to us then we can be have to be forced to think about it. Right. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I just felt like it was important to bring that as far as, like, some context that this has been happening to the tune of what we see constantly now, you know? Mm-hmm. So I feel like a lot of us kind of our, our batteries in this are, are empty. We 
we've been, you know, talking about it for a while, but I, there's been some that have been at it for a lot longer than us, you know? So try to give them a bit of the respect they deserve. And, you know, they, they still continue. So I'll still be here, you know, but mm -hmm. the hard part is, is that talking about these things gets you demonetized. So, you know, you have to find other ways to try to keep your lights on. Um, you can, if you want to help with that, go to codashv.com slash indie news network, scan that QR code on your screen with your camera app. Or if you're in the live chat, put exclamation mark donate. You can give us a little monies if you want to. Um, but if you can't do that. Liking and subscribing, sharing, please share, help fight the suppression and, you know, make sure to leave. A um, you know, make sure to leave a comment. Let us know what you think, you know, otherwise thanks for watching.